Too much news going on to get your head around? Sick of the media's very left-wing view of the world? Have we got the answer for you? The Other Side Australia, your weekly shortcut to Australia's best commentary. Uploads every Friday and summarises the news from a sensible centre-right perspective to balance out the ABC. And unlike the ABC, it's free. The following segment is a shortcut from episode 9 of The Other Side Australia, originally uploaded Friday, October 23, 2020. To hear the full episode and every episode when it uploads, subscribe to The Other Side Australia on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or any good podcast platform. And if you're not into podcasts usually, you can easily listen on YouTube. Just search up The Other Side Australia. And remember to hit the like and the subscribe button so you get alerted when new episodes and shortcuts come online. It's free every Friday. Now, our regular commentator on Australian issues, Alexandra Marshall, tells us about an important new global organisation every Aussie and everyone in the free world needs to be aware of. In the coming weeks, Australia's spy agency ASIO is going to issue advisories to all federal politicians on how to avoid getting tangled up in foreign interference plots. ASIO's Director General, Mike Burgess, told a Senate hearing this week that overseas intelligence services have been trying to curry favour with Aussie politicians by taking advantage of their secret weaknesses, sexual preferences, infidelities and greed. We see evidence of intelligence services deceptively cultivating politicians at all levels of government who will advance the interests of the foreign countries. In the coming weeks, I will write to all Commonwealth parliamentarians to warn they are attractive targets for those trying to steal our secrets and manipulate our decision making. The advice to MPs would tell them what to look for and how they should handle it. Burgess confirmed that ASIO had recently disrupted a plot in which an Australian-based foreign national and a team of foreign intelligence officers were trying to recruit multiple Australian security clearance holders to access sensitive information about our intelligence activities, particularly those directed against their home country, according to a report in The Australian. Burgess said local government councillors were the most frequently targeted by foreign agents, potentially because they'd later go on to higher office. He also repeated his past warning that there were more foreign spies and proxies operating in Australia now than at any time since the Cold War. Well, joining me now is the Aussie queen of conservative, libertarian and classical liberal Twitter, Alexandra Marshall. And Alexandra's been doing some research and writing lately about an increasingly powerful defence cooperation alliance that's headed by Russia and China and expanding into the Middle East, Alexandra. Thank you Good very you much. Here. It's uh, it's lovely to be back. We're going to talk about a thing called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, the SCO, which was formed in 2001 in Shanghai, China. It's a little cooperation organization between China and Russia. Uh, and in 2017, I think it expanded to include India and Pakistan. Yes, so the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization is an evolution of the Shanghai Five, which was China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Uh, And as you correctly said, it was expanded first under the Shanghai Five to include a few more, and then once it became uh, the Shanghai Cooperation, it included Uzbekistan, uh, and most notably, India and Pakistan. Now, Uh, The reason that's really curious is because India is a standout as not being particularly uh, friends or aligned politically with the other members of the organization. So when India joined, particularly in light of Pakistan joining, there was a lot of debate both in India itself and with the rest of the world of what on earth India was doing inside this uh, shifty, I'd have to, you know, it's definitely a shifty organization, uh, considering that it also has waiting in the wings Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and the Arab League nations. And the whole point, of course, is to open up trade routes through the port of Iran from China to overturn the reliance on the U.S. currency and create a new uh, economic level inside Asia and also to basically change the military alliances of half the world's population. So it's not a minor 
alliance by any means. It's quite a powerful group. Right. And, and this is not like yeah. APEC, which is just a business economic cooperation no. alliance. This is a cooperation alliance on security, military activities, uh, as well as culture and economics. Well, and most important, most crucially and importantly, it was created as a way to circumnavigate the UN because two of its members have veto powers on the UN. And the most crucial part of the Shanghai Cooperation is its pact of non-interference, which allows it to break humanitarian charters inside its own nations uh, with the assurance that none of the other countries inside the pact will interfere. That means that if China is in is interring and abusing Uyghurs, yeah. Nobody else in the pact will interfere and they'll even veto the UN from looking into it any, at all or closely, which is why the Shanghai uh, cooperation uh, language is often quoted by Arab nations when they're asked why they don't care about China's abuse of their ideological citizens. Uh, and right. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that is actually the reason why uh, China is allowed to get away with it. Okay, the Uyghurs being a Muslim minority, and of course that should be of concern uh, to those uh, Arab states uh, that we just discussed there. So what is this? Um, you're saying that they're waiting in the wings, the, the Middle Eastern states. Um, it, it, tell me a little bit more about that and, and how this thing might expand. So some of the Middle, and, uh, Middle East nations and the other stands, they have what they call observer status. Others have applied to join and are being considered. Uh, some are, are involved in uh, the trade and military parts of the pact without actually actually being official members. The US applied to be an observer and was rejected offhand. So the West is definitely not allowed to be a part of this pact. Um, okay, so and- obser- observer states include Afghanistan, Belarus, Iran, Mongolia. Uh, there's also dialogue partners, uh, which includes Sri Lanka, Turkey, Nepal, Cambodia, Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, it's a big organisation and just uh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger as an alternative block. Yeah, it might interest you that um, the the last time that it was flexing its muscles was actually to do with Hong Kong, where the Secretary General of the SCO, Vladimir Novov, issued a statement that SCO member states oppose external forces interfering in Hong Kong affairs. Uh, and they issued quite a, a few different statements, including... Um, the use of force and threat, uh, use of force, threat and force without the UN Security Council's approval against countries or groups which seek to monopolise global or regional affairs out of selfish interests. In other words, they were collaborating together in order to stop any uh, external countries from weighing in on China's uh, creep on Hong Kong. So right. they are ex- they are using their political force and muscle to start changing the way we see geopolitics in the world. And they are a significant shadowy operation that has immense power that not a lot of people have clocked onto yet. So India being in part of this is quite odd, as you mentioned. Um, We're a very close ally to India, so is the United States, uh, and they are no friend of Pakistan or China. So what is India doing in there? So this is the question that not just uh, us, but also the US has has been asking India uh, while they were over there, what are you doing joining this this group? And as far as I can determine, you've got to remember that India is surrounded by members of the SCO. And although they may be ideologically aligned to the West, they also have a a look East, East policy that they've had this special relationship with Russia after the Cold War. So they are closer to... uh, Russian interests, who are obviously one of the the main founding members, uh, than we would like. And the worry about India being part of this pact is that Australian politicians believe that should anything happen in the Pacific with China, India will be there to back Australia up. And they take that for granted. I've actually asked several uh, of our uh, leading uh, politicians, and they just say, yep, India will be there, they'll help us. But if they've joined this pact, that actually prohibits them from engaging in any kind of help military Uh, or trade for Australia in the case of China blocking off the uh, South China Sea or or anything like that. So we have to be really careful about what they've signed and why they've signed it. But I do think that the whole thing uh, has a big crack uh, forming in it after China decided to unwisely attack India's borders. When they did that, Russia actually stopped sending some of its military arms to China for the first time in many, many years upon India's request. So uh, I do suspect that uh, China may have blown it by acting too soon uh, as far as showing its cards. 
Okay, so that's that plays well for us. So let's talk about Pakistan uh, now, Pakistan's involvement. Yeah, so Pakistan, which likes to play a uh, threat of nuclear war every other week with uh, India, the reason that they are in there is, of course, China is pouring money into Pakistan via the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. So they are building they are building enormous infrastructure programs into Pakistan, not just to acquire territory in there, but they are also uh, mo- able to move arms across the border along with trade. So uh, India would be quite worried about China empowering Pakistan. And so by joining the pact, they at least are granted a way of observing what is going on inside that group to do with their own interests. Uh, so these are the, some of the theories that are being thrown out there as to why India decided to join that pact. Because as you say, and correctly point out, it's it's controversial even inside India that that, that has been signed. So, Alexandra, it's also interesting to note that the United Nations Human Rights Council, the UNHRC, uh, has just uh, had Pakistan join as a member state. Uh, what's the significance of that in in light of the the uh, the SCO alliance? Well, I think it shows the way in which the United Nations as a general concept has been eroding since it was first created. And let us not forget that it was created to stop socialist and communist powers rising to control the world. And here it is, completely overrun by socialist and communist nations in league with uh, dictators in the third world. So uh, as a general concept in its entirety, it's it's pretty morally bankrupt. And it just seems to stand to reason that the 2021 to 2023 period for the UN Human Rights Council now is chaired by China, uh, Pakistan, Russia, Mexico, Cuba. It's it's not exactly a beacon of uh, human rights inside those nations. And they are meant to be telling us Uh, how nations should treat their citizens. And considering that China, as we've just discussed, has deliberately, and Pakistan, have deliberately entered into an engagement to uh, find a way around committing human rights violations without the UN being able to interfere, they certainly should not be able to be in charge of the UN as well uh, because they will persecute nations who are not part of their SCO, uh, the Shanghai Corporation Organization. So it's basically creating a monopoly uh, that has no interest in human rights and uh, is generally interested in gaining global power. Mm. Yeah, it's scary stuff. What are the implications for Australia and what's your concern about the way Australia is is handling it? Do you have any views on that? Only that our politicians are extremely naive when it comes to how the world is uh, shaping up for the next 10 to 20 years. They, When you speak to our politicians, they are... Uh, almost blind to not only the rise of China, which they've only woken up to because the people inside Australia have started to point out that uh, China is abusing the WTO, the trade relations, and it's becoming obvious that they can't can't deny now that there is a global problem coming. Uh, But as far as the rest of the world, like India and Russia and uh, most of the Arab League, I don't think our politicians have half a clue what's happening. Oh dear. Okay. Well, what do you think? Uh, what do you think we should be doing then? Well, first of all, we have to start talking about it, uh, and our mainstream media has to uh, start to understand that it's not just the UN in charge of the world. There are other uh, larger organisations like the SCO, which is ha- has a larger sphere of influence than the UN, that are controlling the political game. And while ever they are allowed to operate without scrutiny they can be a serious danger to the future of global politics. Oh, boy. And that just takes me right back to the beginning of the show today, which is, you know, we have got to grow up and we've got to wake up and we've got to stop acting like a country that doesn't have any international threat, doesn't have any need to be internationally competitive, can afford to sit around worrying about critical race theory and what pronouns we're calling people. Uh, The Western world needs a massive kick up the backside and we've got to get our act together. Um, Alexandra, a little bit depressing, but thank you very much for your time once again, and we'll catch you, catch you next week. Thanks so much for your research too. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to a shortcut from episode nine of The Other Side Australia, originally uploaded Friday, October 23, 
2020. To hear the full episode and every episode when it uploads, subscribe to The Other Side Australia on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or any good podcast platform. And if you're not into podcasts usually, you can listen on YouTube. Just search up The Other Side Australia. And remember to hit the like and the subscribe button so you get alerted when new episodes and new shortcuts come online. The full episodes are free every Friday.